e eu espero que vocês possam fazer muitas perguntas para ele. Ele esteve conosco aqui pelos últimos dez dias, né? ele vai embora amanhã, e é uma oportunidade, então, em que eu quero que vocês explorem né? na para fazer algumas perguntas para ele nesses dois assuntos que ele vai fazer a apresentação. Então, Jeff, the floor is yours. Muito obrigado. E bem-vindo a todos. E é onde o português ends. I, I, I love being in Brazil. I've been here numerous times. Most of my collaborations are at UFPE, Universidade Federal de Pernambuco, in Recife, with Naum Freidenreich and his wonderful group there. And on this visit, it's a real privilege to be what I see is not only one of the newest, but really the center of photovoltaics research in Brazil. It's exciting to be here. I want to extend my gratitude to Ricardo Ruther for very generous and gracious hospitality, having me here for a close to two weeks. And I also want to thank, uh, I will not name you uh, individually, but the students and the postdocs and the faculty members who have been so kind to me so far and helping me with many things, just from understanding what your work is to arranging my cultural life during the short time I'm in Florianopolis. Uh, After discussing the topics that my group and I work in with Ricardo, we converged on two topics that I hope will be of interest to you. The first, concentrator photovoltaics, is reasonably close to the research that is being performed here. I'm also aware that you do have a concentrator system on which you're doing research. So I hope that some of the concepts will be familiar to most of you. After the first lecture, I understand we'll have a refreshment break, and then there's a second lecture which deals with producing electricity from sunlight, but in a fundamentally different way. I do not anticipate that the audience has a background in the particular method of using rectifying antennas. It's uh, it's a more futuristic and ambitious and a bold way of approaching things, and for those of you who have the patience, without ventilation, without air conditioning, to (laughs) remain and still uh, stay alert, uh, it it will be a pleasure to share that work with you, even though it's a bit far afield. I hope it will stimulate some new thoughts. So in the first slide, just to give you a visual image of where I come from, my, uh, this is the view from my laboratory at the Stable Care campus of Ben Gurion University, about 50 kilometers south of the main campus. We're basically a graduate school and a faculty in desert sciences. I'll tell you about it in a moment. But as you can see, with 70 millimeters a year of rainfall, the landscape is, is dramatically different from the beautiful foliage of the Florianopolis area. And then scientifically, what I'll be covering are the solar cells that are used in concentrated photovoltaics, why they're used, what are the optics, what are the thermodynamics involved in developing the kinds of optical systems in which these cells can operate efficiently and affordably. So this is just an intimation of where we'll be going. And the motivation here is there's been recent progress in two nominally independent areas, which I'll show you. One is in advanced semiconductor devices, multi-junction solar cells. If you do not know what they are, I'll show it to you uh, presently. Uh, Most of you work with single junction cells, meaning it's one material, one PN junction. Um, And the efficiency of these is now well over 40% independently confirmed, but only under high optical concentration. These cells are not tens of centimeters, like many of the cells with which you deal. They are millimeters at most in linear dimension. So that's one area, and that's in solid state physics. The second area is in high concentration optics, meaning hundreds to thousands of suns. It's the degree to which sunlight, the solar beam radiation is concentrated. Now, anyone can do that, but the, the challenge is doing it at a high collection efficiency, that is, without discarding a large fraction of the radiation. I've just shown you here one particular kind of concentrator we'll be returning to later to give you a feeling for the dimensions, a cell that's a millimeter, an entire optic that's only tens of millimeters. And the bottom line, when you combine these, when you conflate 
these is emerging with a miniaturized, ultra-efficient solar cell concentrator that has unprecedented power production density. So that's where I'll be going during the next 30 to 40 minutes. Now just a brief uh, comment on from where I hail. Um, I come from a very small country and uh, a relatively small uh, research faculty. My faculty is called the Blaustein Institutes for Desert Research, Ben-Gurion University of the Negev. We're in the south of the country, and we are a highly interdisciplinary faculty in desert sciences, exploring fundamental applied issues. We divide into three centers. One is in water sciences, hydrology, desalination, water treatment, etc. Second is life sciences, biotechnology, molecular biology, uh, ecology, and the third is the physical sciences, meaning uh, physics, applied math, mechanical engineering, materials engineering, which is my department. I joined just after the faculty was founded in 1977, and a literal bird's eye view of our campus is shown in the left. It's uh, within a small village. We have about 85 faculty members and 200 masters and PhD students and a sprinkling of postdocs. <coughs> and what I show on the right, uh, when you live in such an isolated place, there are not many activities for graduate students, so they work very hard. And they're in the lab all the time. But of course they do have to expect... Here's a nice photo from when I went on a hike with one of my... That's not me, that's one of my graduate students. And I like to use this also to illustrate a lesson I like to teach my students, which is when you decide what problems to tackle. history. Uh, Ben-Gurion went to the United States of America in 1950 to uh, convince Albert Einstein, who was a great supporter of, the, of not only Hebrew University in Jerusalem and all the universities in Israel, but he tried to convince Einstein to come to Israel. Country. And when he declined that, at least to be a professor in the universities. And, and little years later, Einstein shows you great leaders can also be involved in universities. Persist. And when I say I come from a small country, I know you're in the... So we try to compensate the quality of... Back to science. There, there is sunlight of photovoltaics. expensive component, which is the solar cells, is only one over C of the total system. That means most of the system is optics and infrastructure. But the, if we can take the most expensive component and weight it by a factor of one over 1,000, basically we remove it from the cost equation. The second it's that, um, well, I'm sorry, I'll show that to you in a moment, but first I should finish this. So the actual concentration in the commercial systems today is the order of hundreds up to about a thousand. And it shifts the burden from developing, it shifts the burden to developing maximum performance, robust, affordable, high concentration optics. So roughly 50 times more expensive than conventional single crystal silicon solar cells like those that Sun Power of the United States produces. This, these are some photographs from the original days of concentrated photovoltaics at the beginning of this century, 12, 13 years ago, where you see everything was Fresnel lenses. And uh, these are installed in the United States, uh, various places in the U.S., different companies. The car there sets the scale. And the, the geometric concentration is roughly 100, never really cost of aberrated optics. That's the most that could be done. 
I'm going to show you how you can go much higher. Um, the way to do it is to there's no problem in increasing that by a factor of five. The cells are not yet this series to accommodate that. Photograph not a model of the former cell focus corporation, which I like to use because we were involved. We and I'll elaborate uh, array look axis tracking, and each of those squares is an identical and we have options junction cells, and I want to, to fundamentally, physicists, let's see if the laws of laws of physics, fundamental upper bound, how much room for improvement there is in any device that we, and I want to address these, and today, cells as being, they very much are. They are basically the heat of the sun. The we'll look at tunnels. If you do not know, and the fact that passive heat rejection, temperature, the optics of it also has a emergencies of the top device. Current voltage curve, it could, and I just want to. Thank you. Good. So, current against voltage, the zero in the dark on the table, we can measure, we can bias it, and measure. Radiated. Let's say we radiate the photo current is proportional to the voltage value, and you just to the dark current curve, short circuit current, and then the same constant. And once, now of course the open circuit voltage does not does. This is an open photo current proportional to a radiance, and, and then Q is the Electron to relation. The open circuit zero current is just a logarithmic function of the irradiance, and you see that here. So the first condition is of the solar cell, because it's proportional to the logarithm of the energetic motivation for concentrating band gap. Some fabulous, not yet been achieved conversion. Multi-junction cells are predicated on taking several gaps and taking better advantage of the physics that form concentrated cells. near infrared, germanium, Germany, Japan, Spain. The one it increases. Efficiencies of cells are work. The measured efficiency not is a notch above all points. These are not computation. And the cell is of high enough quality, then the internal density becomes efficient and the curve which is a peak efficiency of close to 44 percent. It's just one example that fixed cell temperature. Thermodynamics. So computed thermodynamics the the guidepost. For one junction, see a bit above 30, two junctions, three. And of course, here it's 45. It increases the rate. There is a uh, you can 
whom you want. Thermodynamics and in keep on going. Junctions from sunlight into DC. You know that if you had a car, no five percent. It must be. Less. I'll show you why in this. Now, the testament to human technology, human mind, this commercial so we're well beyond halfway to that limit. You know, for those of you who work in uh, in regular power plants, you know, if you say, "I have a." I have a, a power plant with a steam turbine or a gas turbine, and it has a Carnot efficiency, a fundamental limit. How close has technology evolved to that after almost 100 years? And uh, of course, the, the results are quite impressive. And we're now starting to see that with photovoltaics. This is really the greatness of, uh, of human science. Now, a rule of thumb is if I have a constrained limit, a limited number of junctions, for practical reasons, and a limited concentration. For example, three junctions, 1,000. That's where the industry is today. And the best commercial cells have reached more than 70% of their constrained limit. I said the best cell is 46%, and the constrained thermodynamic limit for three, three junctions, if I interpolate here to 1,000 suns, it turns out to be about 60%. So we're more than 70%. And it's true for all of them. Even at one sun. I mean, forget about concentration. You people are the, the right, you, you are the masters of one sun solar cells, at least. You say, um, what is the best one sun, one junction cell in the world? And we know it's altered devices. Thin film, gallium arsenide. 29% measured independently. I've also measured it in my lab. It's 29%. So this is a phenomenal testament to human technology. And of course, why stop there? There is research ongoing for four and five junction cells. What are the optimal band gaps? They can be determined computationally for a given spectrum, for a given irradiance, for a given temperature. One has to choose some, uh, some convention for uh, designing the cell. And uh, these are the results for a four-junction cell and a five-junction cell. And now, can we find materials? Yes. This is where the research is underway, and there is great progress already. This is just an example of th the incentive for more junctions, even at just 1,000th concentration. And here we're even al considering a re more realistic cell temperature of 60 degrees centigrade, or 333K. And uh, you see that there, I there must be a diminishing returns relation. Like in power plants, when you have bottoming cycles, you have a gas turbine, high pressure steam, low pressure steam. You have, you have uh, the, the analog. It's by no means uh, identical, but in analog here, uh, more junctions. And there is a benefit to more and more. And it's not negligible. And that's why this is a vibrant research area. There's another technology which is critical, tunnel diodes. This is an integral part of these cells. And here's why. You know about PN junctions. Take two PN junctions, put them one on top of another, and irradiate them. No current flows. The efficiency is zero. That's what a diode does. No current can flow. So what you need, if you want to stack these in series, in a monolithic cell, you must have some material between them which has two properties. One. It has to be electrically conductive. We have to get the electrons in holes going through there. But it also has to be optically transparent. So it cannot be too thick. If it's too thick, it will be optically transparent. And the electrical resistivity will be too high. This is an absolutely brilliant and challenging technology. It was developed without any regard to photovoltaics in the last century by Leo Isaki. He won the Nobel Prize in Physics for inventing tunnel diodes, just to point out how non-trivial it was at the time. And now it's part of the 
production process. So here is the three junction cell, and between each of the two junctions, you must have a tunnel junction. The thickness is of the order of 10 nanometers, just to give you a feeling for how thin these are. And this is a, just showing you, this is the solar spectrum, solar irradiance against wavelength, and showing you where these three cells fit the solar spectrum. Obviously not the entire spectrum, the infrared part is not exploited, but you do your best with three junctions. And this is uh, already well above 40%. Now there are two options, as every electrical engineer knows, if I have more than one junction. I can put them in series, I can put them in parallel. What should you do? Well, th th there's no trivial answer. Both of them are on the table. One of them is tandem cells. I put the three cells in series, electrically in series, with tunnel diodes. Of course, the highest band gap junction intercepts sunlight. And uh, the advantage here is, because they're in series, I have the minimum current. Important because electrical dissipation goes as the square of the current. So minimum current means minimum dissipation. But I have to match the currents. If I have two cells at different currents, you know they operate at the minimum current. Just like you string light bulbs up in series, one of them goes, that's it, it's gone. Uh, so same here. And this is a delicate balancing act that every manufacturer has. And they must have tunnel diodes, which, which uh, increases cost and, uh, and sophistication. The other is to put them in parallel. If we put them in parallel, we, have to, we need a few challenges. One, we have to split the spectrum. The high energy photons for the first cell, medium for the second, and low for the third. The advantage is no tunnel diodes are required. They're all in parallel. An enormous simplification. And we don't have to current match, we have to voltage match. It's much easier. The current is proportional to the number of subcells, but we therefore have a much higher current actually proportional to the number of junctions. And the dissipation goes as I squared. So we have three junctions, it's three squared is nine times the dissipation. This is a drawback if the series resistance is not very low. But the real killer here to date, it's not fundamental, it's only a, uh, a pragmatic problem, it's the optics. No one yet has developed a spectrum splitting optic that is efficient, meaning, let's say, doesn't discard half of the power. So the winner so far, if you look at the concentrated photovoltaic industry, is every system you'll see out there in the field is in series, monolithic cells. Now, in, in my lab, we, um, we're interested in characterizing cells, uh, information that neither the manufacturers nor the researchers apparently had discovered. So uh, just let me show you what we built. It's not that complicated, but we were able to generate some interesting results. Um, for those of you who like telescopes, I just built a Cassegrain telescope, uh, except it's called a solar concentrator. It's a paraboloidal dish. It's only 20, millimeter, 20 centimeters in diameter. This is a small mirror up here, a flat mirror. Basically, I image the sun to this point downward facing, and I put an optical fiber of high numerical aperture, meaning it can accept large angles, and that's outdoors on a two-axis tracker. Very high transmissivity fiber, high quality quartz, you can purchase these off the shelf. And now I bring it into the laboratory with air conditioning and comfort, and I can interrogate cells. So here is the first generation of concentrator cells from the beginning of the century. 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters, here's a one millimeter fiber, and we can probe. We can measure current voltage characteristics everywhere, and the cell reveals some interesting properties to us. And there were some pleasant surprises, because usually when you have a new technology, things are not as good as you anticipated. But here they were even better. Um, first of all, there was an insensitivity to strongly localize the radiation, meaning if the whole cell was supposed to receive a certain number of watts, but I took it, all that power and put it into that one spot, the decrease in efficiency was very small. That had not been expected. It's a good testament to the manufacturer. 
the efficiency can peak at irradiance values as high as thousands of suns, not just hundreds. That also was not anticipated. No heat rejection problems on a passive cooling, just a simple piece of aluminum that is the same size as the collection aperture, meaning, let's say, a thousand times the cell area. So if the cell is a square centimeter, a thousand square centimeters. And we performed experiments over many hours. There was no uh, perceptible damage or deterioration of the cells. And the results indicated when, when the whole technology was one centimeter by one centimeter, these localized irradiation results indicated that if, if the industry would miniaturize to millimeter scale, they could achieve a, a significant increase in efficiency. You know, not not a, a breakthrough, but something that really had not been appreciated. And the experiments pointed that out. And indeed, this is the way that the, uh, the industries have evolved since then. These are some measurements we took in our lab back in uh, about six years ago uh, for a cell that was nowhere near today's. Uh, uh, the peak efficiency here is about 35%. This is efficiency against the logarithm of the concentration. Uh, this cell is two millimeters in diameter. Uh, you can see the, one, the fiber there. This is a 0.6 millimeter fiber. And uh, you see here that the sensitivity to concentration is quite weak. It peaks at about 3,000 suns. Quite impressive. Um, furthermore, when we took th all, the, all the power of 1,000 suns and concentrated it into one-tenth the area, so the local concentration is 10,000, the efficiency was basically unchanged. This already tells you about the power of miniaturization. 10,000 means the whole cell is at 10,000. No, we're saying we took 1,000 onto one-tenth of the cell area. So this, this in itself uh, turned out to be useful in directing the industry. Second is the question of heat rejection. You know, the, the naive person says, oh, you, you, you concentrate 1,000 times. Don't you have to force circulation, water, cool it? No. You just do the computation of heat conduction, thin efficiency, convection. Uh, it's a standard exercise in first year heat transfer and engineering on a simple two millimeter sheet of aluminum uh, that's the same size as the collection aperture. So here's an experiment we did. This is at 10,000 suns. 10,000, this is 10 watts on one square millimeter. And this cooling fin is the size of the optic that collects it. So wh what we showed was that passive heat rejection is feasible when the cell area is up to a square centimeter at hundreds of suns and uh, for square millimeters at thousands of suns. The measured temperature increase is only 20 to 25 above the ambient conditions. And as I like to say for those who, um, who don't believe in an experiment, we also have the model. So these are what can be achieved with passive heat rejection. In short, this is not a problem. This is not an obstacle. Now the motivation to develop ultra miniature cells. One, series resistance is smaller if the cell is smaller. It's not quite proportional, but almost. So if there's lower series resistance, we can go to higher irradiance and have higher efficiency. Second, Independent of exactly what the efficiency is, the concentration at which the efficiency peaks can increase. And we know that totally passive cooling will work, so we're not worried. This is not a measurement. It's a computation. It was done by the Sharp Corporation when it was developing concentrator photovoltaics. It's efficiency against the log, logarithm of the concentration for four different diameters of cells. And you see exactly what's confirmed by our experiments, meaning that the cells are miniaturized, the efficiency decreases, in this case from about 38 and a half to 41, and the peak uh, concentration ratio is increased, which makes it more affordable. You're paying less for the cells. So even though this is not to scale, but this was the original Spectrolab cell of 2003, one centimeter by one centimeter. And after our studies, they started producing one millimeter cells. 
This is, of course, a magnification of it. Now I have to do some optics. Now that I've given you solid state physics, thermodynamics. Concentrating sunlight. There's a fundamental bound for concentrating sunlight. You may think, how can that be? The sun is a point. I learned in first year physics, if I have a point source, I can focus it to a point. Yeah, but if you had a point source, you could. But in nature, in the universe, there is no such thing as a point source. No such animal. If, it, if there were, it would have infinite brightness. So everything is extended to some extent. So is the sun. Now, the surface of the sun can be well approximated as a black body. We know that from experimental measurements of satellites. And this is the approximate temperature. And the irradiance on the surface of the sun is this in watts per square millimeter. If you like, if you like watts per square meter, just multiply by one million. Now, here on Earth, just above the atmosphere, this is the irradiance that you measure. Of course, it's just the dilution of power density. The ang if, you, uh, if you measure the solar disk, it subtends a half angle, a numerical aperture of 0 0.0047. Now, let me show you the shortest derivation I know for the thermodynamic limit of concentrating sunlight. It's just based on Gauss' law. Not to scale. Here's the sun with its radius. Here we are, and R1 is the distance between us. Theta is just the point 0047 radians. So the irradiance we measure here on Earth is just the irradiance on the surface of the sun, 62.4, times 1 over distance squared. That's Gauss' law. Well, 1 over distance squared is sine squared of the angle. So this tells you that um, the irradiance falls off by a factor of sine squared theta, which is 46,000. Now, that, re that relates to irradiance. You can play clever tricks with dielectrics, which have a refractive index greater than 1, and I'll skip it for a moment. But the second law of thermodynamics comes in because it says, to be rigorous, you cannot bring a target to a higher temperature, not irradiance, to a higher temperature than the source without inputting in, uh, work or additional energy. So that gives us the inequality. So there is a fundamental upper limit. Now what is not apparent and is hidden in this derivation is that, um, first of all, we have to always be pointing at the sun. So we need accurate two-axis tracking. And that in our optical system, the exit angle has to be the full hemisphere, an exit half angle of 90 degrees. Shortly, I'll generalize that. But there's another message here. Diffuse radiation cannot be concentrated. I never cease to be amazed at some manufacturers who come and say, you know, the diffuse fraction is high. Let's concentrate the diffuse light, too. Um, that's impossible, not just difficult. There's a difference between difficult and impossible. This is the generalized bound, just to give you a feeling for how it depends on the design of our optics. If I have some far field source coming from the left, call it the sun, over some full angle two theta in, my concentrator does not necessarily deliver over 180 degrees. It's some limited value. For whatever reason, I have to distance the target, or I have glass, and the reflectivity at large angles is high because of Fresnel reflect, whatever the reason. It's some known number, theta exit less than or equal to 90 degrees, and I can fill it with a transparent dielectric, like glass or polymer, anything, of a known refractive index. Then the fundamental limit is not quite 1 over sine squared of theta in. It's this. It can be increased by the square of the refractive index, but it's also decreased by the sine squared of the exit angle. This can be derived from phase space conservation. That's the way physicists like to do it. But phase space, or eton du, is just the area times the projected solid angle. We consider it the entry at the exit, and then we do the math. So we can increase by n squared. That's important. Because for most materials we use, like glass or polymers, refractive index for the solar spectrum is about 1.5. And n squared is therefore more than 2. So this is far from small. Now, in solar thermal, we often need high concentration to keep heat loss down. But in photovoltaics, it's more subtle. 
So here is a limit. And you say, what is holier, the concentration or the input angle? You might say, well, the input, that's the sun. I have no control over that. No, no, not so. This is really a convolution of the intrinsic size of the sun, the 4.7 milliradians, and all the optical errors and tracking errors in your system. And they translate into big money. Ask any concentrated photovoltaic company what they're paying for, and they'll tell you optical accuracy, optical precision in the lens or in the mirror or in the tracker. So this theta n is more than the solar disk. Now, 46,000 is a big number. There's no cell that even comes close to being able to accept that. So you can either view this as, you see, I can maximize the concentration at a fixed optical error. But in photovoltaics, we don't do that. We do the uncommon. We maximize the optical error at a fixed concentration. Say, 1,000, that's perfect for the cell. How forgiving, how liberal can optical tolerance be? And that is what makes it affordable. So this is what I wanted to stress in this, and that's where we'll be going. Now, optics for concentrated photovoltaics. Overcoming problems with existing technologies, lenses, well, they have geometric aberration, they have chromatic aberration, meaning each wavelength has a different focal length, and they fall far short of the thermodynamic limit. And then there are reflective systems, like parabolas. They also have aberration. But if you use a big dish, this needs active cooling because the laws of heat transfer that I told you about on one square centimeter don't work on a square meter as readily. You have to actively cool it. You have to site this 15 meters off the ground. Um, you're going to irradiate parts that are not cell, and they may degrade rapidly, and you have non-uniform illumination in the focal region if you want to collect all the light. These systems were built and they quickly died from the concentrated photovoltaic industry for these reasons. Now I want to give you a case study which I can give you fortunately because I was personally part of, uh, part of this exercise. High concentration efficient designs for the former Sol Focus Corporation. I say former, they were in existence from 2004 to 2014 for 10 years, did very well. And then, unfortunately, they, uh, they were dissolved. It happened shortly after the tragic death of their founder and driving spirit, the late Gary Conley, uh, prematurely, a man of only 50, and a, a real visionary and a great engineer and businessman. But when, we, when I first met with Gary, he said, I said to him, give me the wish list. You know, everything you want in your concentrated photovoltaic system. And don't worry whether it's practical. Th that will be our challenge. And I'll tell you what violates the laws of physics and that we discard. And whatever does not violate the laws of physics becomes a research problem. First thing he said is, I want ultra compact. All these Fresnel systems have F numbers of one, meaning the depth and the entry are roughly the same. So they're deep, like this. And he said, when I install photovoltaic systems, I have to ship them. And when you ship, you pay per unit volume, not per unit weight. And as he said, it's expensive to ship air. So I want it as compact as possible. If possible, an aspect ratio of not more than a third. And we still want high collection. If anyone can give you a third, but they have to discard much of the power. Second, I want a net flux concentration between 500 and 2,000 for the cells I have now at 500 in 2004. And in the next generation when there be 2,000. And I want them at the highest optical tolerance possible so I can have an inexpensive production process. And we realize that at such high concentration, if you want to be efficient optically, you, you just cannot tolerate chromatic aberration. So we need mirrors. We, can, we have to go with reflective, not refractive optics. So let me show you the evolution. What we developed was uh, a tailored optic, which you see here. Um, and you see in this first module, which we built while I was on sabbatical at the University of California, and uh, Gary Conley here on the right, and Steve Horn, who was the chief technical officer, we were all working together. We invented an optic that uh, is, uh, the sun comes from the top, a primary mirror. It's not a standard conical shape, reflects light up to a secondary mirror and down to a focus. To extract the light 
to the cell behind here on a heat sink, we used a non-imaging glass a terminal concentrator. I'll come to the other one in a moment. And this was the first system installed uh, close to a, uh, a megawatt in Europe. So this first generation was what are called aplanatic optics. It's imaging optics that eliminate the two leading orders of geometric aberration. It's achromatic, meaning it has no chromatic aberration because they're mirrors, they're silvered mirrors. And we had the non-imaging terminal concentrator. Here you see a sort of ray trace onto the primary, up to the secondary, and out. It was ultra compact. It had a fabulous aspect ratio of one to four, meaning it's 31 centimeters across and a little under eight centimeters deep. The net flux concentration was more than 500. It was modular, and it had a liberal off-axis tolerance. This we mean by off-axis. And, and this isn't just how accurate the tracker is. Let me remind you of something. Look at you know look at look at this array here. My height is not up to there. Um, maybe th this is more than two meters off the ground. The module here, the center, is pointing right at the sun. But there's a torque on this. This is hundreds of kilograms. So this is going to deviate from normal incidence. And what happens? So by good tolerance, we mean even if it's not pointing exactly at the sun, we still get the sun in there, almost 100%. All this course is published. And uh, so I developed with Gary and Steve the first module here in California at 2005. At the time, this was the best sell. This was the drawing. And then, of course, I returned home and saw focus continued brilliantly. They went from this uh, quarter of a, roughly quarter of a kilowatt up to a two kilowatt prototype. And then in 2007, the seven kilowatt arrays. This is in Palo Alto, California for a pumping, water pumping by the way, totally passive cooling. The back is a sheet of aluminum, two millimeter stick. The cells measured increased only 20 degrees. And their first very big system was installed in Europe, 200 kilometers south of Madrid. From the day it went online in November 2008 to today, no degradation, no deterioration, performing at approximately 100% of predicted performance. Subsequently, they were penalized for having these hexagonal, come back, these hexagonal dishes, which were there for structural stability issues. The whole box is not filled with collection, and when you go to an efficiency testing institute, you pay a efficiency penalty, so we redesigned it for square dishes. That was not difficult. 900 concentration. This is a 15 kilowatt array. Again, that's measured. There are 560 mini dishes, all of them nominally identical. And this was the array that comprised the lion's share of uh, salt focus installed systems. And this, the nice thing, the solved problems in concentrated photovoltaics are inverters exist. Now, I've been learning some new things from Ricardo and some of you about the intricacies of inverters. And uh, they're very important, indeed. And they're no less important here. Uh, here, the, the systems that they installed did not encounter any problems, and they were designed properly. They're efficient, they're affordable, they're robust. Two axis trackers, affordable, with a tolerant, measured tolerance of plus or minus a tenth of a degree. Heat sinks, also the back encasement, no problem. 20 degrees above ambient. Modules hermetically sealed. Over years, no dust or condensation penetration. They're cleaned about bi-weekly, and every cell has a bypass diode. When you concentrate by hundreds or thousands, you can afford a bypass diet on every single cell because you weighted by one over a thousand. The additional motivation for very small cells going from centimeter to millimeter technology, I explained that to you, I won't belabor it, but what for, for us as the optics people, it created an option that didn't exist before. My concentrator is filled with air, the previous one, but now, of course, if I filled it with glass, Polymer would weigh, it would be ridiculous. Heavy. It would be so heavy. But if it's now a millimeter, instead of 31 centimeters, it could be 31 millimeters in entry and less than 8 millimeters deep, peak. Average amount of glass, 4 millimeters per unit area, which is not basically the same as this window glass. 
So we have the option of thin planar molded glass concentrators, inexpensive mass production, barely more immersed than common window glass. And we can adopt precision microfabrication assembly techniques that are used in the industry. But we needed the optics. So we took the same kind of aplanatic optics and redesigned it. And the extra degree of freedom here, filling it with uh, refractive index 1.5, allowed us to eliminate the terminal concentrator and put the cell directly outside. And this is the drawing, when we did the optics properly, of the 900 concentrator device with a one millimeter cell, all glass, mirrored on the back of the primary, mirrored on the secondary. So the optical principle is the same here. There's no lens action, there's no refraction. It's pure reflection, but taking advantage of filling it with glass. Um, this is what we call generation two, and it was prototyped, and it was put in research and development for this cell. So as you see, about three centimeters diameter, one centimeter cell. These are the drawings we drew up for what the module would look like, and then we built it. This is the first handheld one. You can see it's not that big, 41, 27. There are 160 units here. And here was generation one with Gary, and here Steve is holding generation two with three centimeter units, one millimeter cells. Um, this was never mass produced. The company, unfortunately, collapsed before that. So the generation one went into mass production on large multi-megawatt systems on the one centimeter cells. And this, at least, we managed to design it, um, to verify it, to build it, and to test it. All of these at about 1,000 suns. And just some updates for those of you who like to think in more general terms than what the specific case that happened at Salt Focus. What is the update on concentrated photovoltaics as of a couple of months ago. And what I'm telling you is based on confirmed measurements, not based on projections. First, the highest cell efficiency measured is 46%. That's commercial. It's a four junction cell, just came out. These are the four junctions. The same top and middle junction as in the three junction cells, but now the infrared part has been redesigned. This is an efficiency at 500 suns. The highest commercial module efficiency with all of the optical losses is now 39%. You have to admit, these are really impressive figures given that it's just the transition point. It will be improving. There's proven reliability in field data for more than six years. Um, the total grid connected and installed concentrated systems are a little over 360 megawatts peak. I know that's small compared to uh, the other technologies it's still far from negligible. Uh, Ricardo told me about uh, using performance ratio, so I added that. The measured performance ratios are 75 to 80 percent for these systems. The levelized cost of electricity in Brazilian currency for the latest systems is about 0.4 per kilowatt hour in for clear climates, of course, not for Florianopolis. No, no, insult, no, no offense intended. Uh, but nevertheless, there's been a rash of bankruptcies in these companies. So, you know, so all, of, all of this is physics and engineering, and this is economics. Economics and politics, I guess. And so with that, and without air conditioning and ventilation, and you've been very patient, just to remind you again where we started, we look at the conflation of advances in solid state physics, advances in high performance, high concentration optics, understand the thermodynamics, understand the optics and the solid state physics, and we have on the table, commercially, um, systems with unprecedented conversion efficiency. So if there are questions, I'm happy to entertain them, and I thank you for being such a patient audience under such hot conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so, do we have questions? Quem quer fazer alguma pergunta? Hi, professor. Uh, when it comes to photovoltaics, we always think about the temperature problem that interferes in the cell efficiency. And at the beginning, I thought that 
I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear the last sentence. The temperature uh, problem yes. that interferes in the cell efficiency. It does not. It does not. The, the, the measured temperature increase here on okay. these systems is between 20 and 25 degrees above the environment. That is yeah, not uh, a that's major That's what, what I'm interested in, in because uh, what I thought that by concentrating the sun, you'd have higher temperatures. And I want to understand how this no. uh, behavior, temperature behavior works. This is a good question. I would like to write. Can I write on a board? There are two points. No, I'm glad you asked this. It also means there's one point I did not explain sufficiently clearly. Okay, thank you. One point is easier, uh, w one point is not obvious at all, the second. But the first point is, if I have a cell of a given dimension, one unit, whatever, one millimeter, and I put it thermally bonded, of course this is in 3D now, right? Three, so this is axisymmetric. And this, let's say, is something like uh, 33 units, so the area is a factor of... Uh, 1,000 bigger, and I irradiate this with 1,000 suns. There's a very good thermal bond. This is, this is the PV. This is aluminum, roughly you know two two mm thick. That's what you saw there. So there's a very there's a very small thermal resistance here. And then you have the fin. This is again basic heat conduction problem, fin effect, and then it it both convects and radiates from both sides. You solve that problem. I'm, I'm not asking you to do it now. You, you can solve that problem, analytically, numerically. And then uh, for these particular parameters, let's say aluminum, you paint the aluminum, of course. You paint it white so it has a high emissivity. Um, and you find out that the delta T is roughly 20 to 25K. Delta meaning above the, whatever the environment is. That's it. Oops. So this is point number one. And again, this is not simply a computation. I've measured this in my lab many times. So have other groups. And all the concentrated systems in the field are measured. Now, it's, you know, as they say, any fool can be foolish. So you, you can always design a foolish system which increases by 50 degree, of course. But let's, let's talk about what, what is achievable in commercial terms. But the other is more subtle. And that is, if I take the efficiency, eta, and ask, how does it change with that? Let me take the relative. Let me take the logarithm of this and take d log eta dt. Now, for the cells with which you deal, so first of all, this is minus <laughs> 0. Point, this will be units of 1 over k. What you usually have is about 0.004, 0.005. This is also a function of concentration. And I showed you that at the beginning, the temperature coefficient. Now, for you, that's not crucial because you operate at one sun or close to it. But here, if we work at 1,000x, and I, uh, what I'm about to tell you, I've measured in my lab. So this is not, again, a calculation. It's 0.001. That's on the three-junction cell that's out there in the field. So even if it increases 25 degrees, that's 2.5% relative, not absolute. And you, you can barely measure the, the, the efficiency that accurately. Relative, right? I mean, see, if the cell is 40% efficient, then you know, plus or minus what? Plus or minus 1.5? Well, plus or minus 1 is already this, this accuracy. So this is the more subtle point. First of all, that this coefficient decreases with the magnitude decreases with concentration, a and th because it's a three-five semiconductor, not a silicon or, um, or a two-six semiconductor, uh, but also that it's so small. So you combine these two, and yeah, in indeed, the heat rejection is not a problem. That's the nice part about one of the nice parts about concentrator photovoltaics. But thank you for asking. Very good. Uh, 
Uh, I have a question regarding, uh, so your calculations in the, in the theoretical side of your studies and how you translate it into the, the industry. When you went from uh, generation one to generation two, and you mentioned that generation two never reached the market, uh, so your, your calculations regarding the size of these cells and the concentration were probably ahead of the time. Right, of, of the industry. Yes. Why is that you didn't go directly for the very small miniaturized cells in the first place? Nobody was producing them. Yeah, but who, who was producing them uh, when, when you went for these prototypes? I'll explain. In 2003, 2004, when we started the research, there were no one millimeter cell. It was a centimeter cell. We already understood the physics, why it could be why it would benefit if miniaturized. But I couldn't make cells. So we took the one centimeter cells with the solar furnace, I with the fiber, and it's not a direct proof, it's an indirect proof. And that, that already motivated. Now, now I'll tell you something that's true life and is a little humorous. So I spoke to Spectrolab at the time. I'm a university professor like you. I said to Spectrolab, would you please make one millimeter cells for me, and I'll do this. And get low, who are you? I mean, how, how many cells do you want? Ten? I mean, the time we're talking to you on the phone is a loss of money for us. Yeah. Then Gary Conley called them up. He had already purchased one million cells from them. And he said, I'm interested in one millimeter cells. To him, they listened. <laughs> and uh, so they made, so let's say they make a batch for him, and then he gives them to me, and I do the <laughs> Do the experiment. Of course, he kept some in the company, and when we prototyped, they were able to prove that. So, uh, yes, the cells were made. And then other companies learned that. Uh, I didn't mention the name of the company, but there's another company in the US, MCOR. They have two millimeter cells. I called them up. I said, Can I purchase your cells? They said, No. You're, you're, just, you're just a university lab, you're, you're not a serious consumer. Then I had Gary Conley call them up and he said, I'm buying Spectrolab cells, but I'm thinking of MCOR cells. And they knew he buys them by the million. So then they made them. Now, maybe they made them for other people too. I, I, I shouldn't dismiss that. But Gary obtained them. I said, Gary, send me 20, send me 20. And then we start doing experiments. And this is how we learn the physics of those cells. And the heat rejection too. I mean, even though we had done heat rejection, you can do heat rejection on a plate with a fiber of it. You have the cell that makes it totally credible. So we did heat rejection, we did efficiency, and we did the measurements. And so the theory is basically confirmed. Now, why didn't the whole industry migrate to that? One problem is series resistance. You pay for lower series resistance. So you know, why is the new record cell peaking at 500 suns? The answer is it costs too much, probably. It costs too much for them to go to lower series resistance. But let me give you a, an encouraging fact. I didn't mean there's a company in the US, a young company called Semprius with an S. They have installed commercial systems. This is not just some backyard installation. The cells they use are 0 0.6 millimeters on a side. 0 0.6 by 0 0.6 millimeters. The concentration is about 1,100. In other words, this, they, they understood this. They didn't need lectures. I mean, they, they know how to read the literature. And, and so this is the direction. In fact, there's a, there's a cute paper I published with one of my former postdocs, which was we were inspired and said, is, is there a limit? You know, how, how, how small can you make these cells and still benefit from the energetic value, putting the economics aside? So we, we also addressed that and did the basic physics and answered that question. It doesn't go down to the nanometer scale. You, you lose too much in edge effects. And because edge effect, the bigger the cell, the smaller the edge. And so all of this comes into account. Um, of course, if, if, if you have small cells, it's wasteful, right? You, you have a wafer. You have to cut it up. Every time you cut, you lose something. So and you want to cut one millimeter, you lose much more. So all the economics come into play. And I, I would never be so presumptuous as to tell a company, let's say, but we give them the physics and the engineering input they need, and they're, they're first class. They, they know how to do the rest. Unfortunately, all the big companies have been collapsing.
dynamics and concentrics and soul focus. And now you told me you have in Goa, even though they weren't solely photovoltaic. So that, that's a kind of sad reality, and I don't <laughs> grasp all the economic aspects. But th th the flame is still alive. The, the exciting thing about concentrated photovoltaics is that the efficiency you can reach is so much higher than anything else and any, any one junction, any one sun cell. And what, what you've shown me, and some of you have shown me, is that the price of these photovoltaics is becoming so low that basically you're not paying for them any longer. You're paying for the land, for the infrastructure, for the inverters, for power conditioning, for ch which is not going to decrease very much. So what that means is you have every incentive to generate as much energy from a square kilometer of land as possible. So efficiency becomes paramount. And then this becomes attractive. The obvious limitation, as I said, you cannot concentrate diffuse light. So, you know, what is the future in a place like Florianopolis? Probably not too good. Uh, fortunately, there are enough places on Earth that have higher radiance that can probably uh, give potential impact to this. Yeah, e even here in Brazil, you have many uh, sites where you have uh, DNI levels which are considerably 10, 15, even 20 percent higher than uh, latitude tilt. Yeah. Uh, I have another question about the chromatic aberration. Uh, from what I've shown you this morning on, on the spectral content of sunlight here uh, in Brazil compared to the standard, uh, how do manufacturers design their cells around the chromatic aberration of, of this kind of, of lenses when they have lenses? Yeah, um, I, I cannot speak for each and every manufacturer. Um, each wavelength has a different focal length. And whatever condition they select for their design, they try to minimize the light that's spread outside the target, the cell. So you need to know, you know what, what is the tightness of the focus you need, what's the spectrum you're designing for. There are no universal generalizations. It's a mess, absolutely. Now, if you're at low concentration, like only 100, it's small. But beyond that, it starts to become it's serious. Mm -hmm. You want to go higher than that, it, it's, uh, it, it almost eliminates them. And that's why we went to reflective optics. Mm -hmm. So because current mismatch in this triple junction, four junction cells would be a problem. Current mismatch is a problem, absolutely. That's why all the research in the, in the parallel cells, right, where you don't have to worry about current mismatch. I mean, well, all these are, you're right, all these are important points taken into account. The current mismatch is, is not, has not turned out to be a, a major problem in concentrated photovoltaics, mainly because the spectrum doesn't change much in the climates where it's viable, in clear climates. So it's sort of a, a chicken and egg problem. In other words, th the problem is not significant, so don't worry about it. Just design for the spectrum you have most of the time. I'll grant you in a place like this, yeah, it, it's probably far greater. Like you, you showed me today the question of uh, inversion losses due to the clipping of ultra-high irradiance events. So in a clear climate, you don't have that. And here, you convinced me, you've done the measurements, there's no question. This, this is significant, it must be contended with. Bravo. Ok, thank you. Mais alguma pergunta? Então, nós vamos agradecer mais uma vez o professor Jeff. Vamos fazer um intervalo de 20 minutos. Aí voltamos para a segunda palestra em seguida. Muito obrigado.